Instead of breaking a single pupa pair, you break many thousands of pupa pairs, and it's your ability to sense how many of those pupa pairs that you broke um, that, that gives you the energy resolution. And the way that it does is it, it, it gives rise by the connected inductance effect uh, an additional inductance in the circuit. And this can be thought of as if you have the, the kinetic energy stored in the Cooper pairs, as you break the Cooper pairs, then you, you generate an additional inductance in the materials. And the way that we sense this is by putting uh, a sample of the superconductor into a, a resonant circuit, as shown here, uh, where the, yeah, so uh, where for a simple sort of LC circuit, you have this uh, this uh, resonate resonance um, loop here that you can see. Um, as the photon comes in, it changes the surface properties of this resonator, gives you an additional inductance, which changes the resonant frequency. Okay, and it is th it is this uh, change that we can sense and use this in order to determine the energy of the incoming photon. Okay. And the way we do this uh, is by sending a microwave probe signal. Uh, microwave probe signal at this frequency and looking for the change in the transmission of that signal. Okay. And as the photon comes in on the right hand side here, we have a time sort of microseconds of time in microseconds. Uh, on the on the x-axis, and then here is a phase shift, which is a sort of do, a measure of the amount that this this probe signal has shifted with respect to its sort of steady state equilibrium state. So, as you can see, we have this characteristic fast rise, exponential decay, pulse, and it is the the the, the magnitude of this pulse is purely dependent on the number of group pairs that were broken. And so the additional inductance in the circuit, okay, and that changes as a function of the energy. So as I said, it's uh, you know for uh, the energy, typical energy gap of some of the materials that we sort of talk about, shown up here on the in the top left. Uh, so on the left here, you can see that you know in, in aluminium and also platinum silicide, which is a, a material that we use nowadays. We, you can see that the energy gap is many tens of thousands times smaller than it is in silicon. And if you use this energy gap here, you can get a measure of the intrinsic energy resolution of the device just from a simple equation. And then all we this is shown on the right on the bottom right here. On the left, we have individual pulses. We take a monochromatic light source and shine that and measure many thousands of these pulses and plot the histogram of the measured peaks. Okay, so all we're doing is putting a monochromatic. If it was a perfect detector, this would be a delta function on the right hand side here. It's not perfect. There's an uncertainty in, in how well we can measure the, the height of this pulse here. Okay, and that gives rise to an energy resolution. Now, in this device here on the right hand side, the energy resolution there is something like about 15. Okay, typically a lot of other tests relatively typical for a lot of our sort of current single pixel devices um, translated that is sort of somewhere between broadband and narrow band which is really optical engineering for us okay just to give you a, a bit of an idea okay but if we look at a sort of the theoretical limit and again as you can imagine this is material dependent but the, the theoretical limit for some of the materials we're using is around about 150 Okay, which would give you some, somewhere sort of a low resolution set possible. Okay, as I said, the circuit that we have is, is shown on the left here, which is a small capacitor and uh, inductor in a resonant circuit. Okay, and the, the actually how this sort of transfers into the, the actual geometry of a, of a pixel in a real device is shown on the right hand side here. So here we have. Yeah. Okay, so we have it, it is capacitively coupled to this feed line. So this feed line meanders around and is used to, to, to carry the, the, the feed line signal. Okay, and then we have our inductor, which is this part here, and the capacitor. Okay, and then you can. Okay, 
So the important one of the big important things for M kids compared to a lot of other superconducting detectors, there are other ones that you in the X-ray astronomers especially may well be familiar with, just the transition edge sensors or even superconducting tunnel junction devices. The big difference really for M kids is that they're very naturally um, multiplexing. So you can have many, many, many of these pixels on a single microarray feed line. Okay, whereas for and, and doing a frequency to make multiplexing, whereas for a lot of these other sensors, it's very difficult. It's a lot of cold wiring and sort of time domain multiplexing that goes on. And you can see this the way we do this, you can sort of see probably here best, very easy to see. But you can see that because of this resonant circuit, all we have to do is tune the capacitance of each pixel to be slightly different. And that gives us a different resonant frequency. And you can sort of see that here, where this is the capacitor. You can see here, this is sort of full capacitor. Maybe I can get you. Full capacitor here, whereas some of these, there's a lot less of these digitated fingers that are there. Okay. So that gives us a way to multiplex these into very large ways. The frequency domain multiplexing is done um, by something called software defined radio. Okay, this is a, a powerful FPGA and uh, DAC and, and ADC converters that generates a cone of all these different frequencies. Okay, in software, converts that up to this sort of gigahertz frequency range that we operate at, passes it through the cryostat, okay, comes back out again, and then converts it back down. And basically, we just compare the input and output sine wave for each one of these pixels and measure the phase shift between the two. Sounds very simple, it's not quite as simple as that, and that's something that we're actively sort of working on here now as well. So, are these things real? Yes, these things are real. So, just over a decade ago now, we went on Sky with them for the very first time. This was an image of the very first array that we used. It was a thousand pixels, which was at that time already 15 times larger than any sort of uh, superconducting array that had ever been uh, taken onto Sky. Uh, it had a couple of feed lines, so as I say, in each one, each one of these feed lines at that time had 512 resonators on a single feed line. And you can see here, it's a slightly different geometry, but you can still see here that we have these, uh, these uh, capacitors that were tuned to be in slightly different frequencies. Us at the Palomar Observatory back in 2011. Um, so, one of the things that I say, you know, so these are superconductors. So, one of the challenges to some degree is that we have to cool these to uh, sub Kelvin temperatures. We typically operate the devices at around about 100 milli Kelvin. Okay, so uh, this, as you can see on the sort of left hand side here, is our, our little fridge here, our little ADR fridge. Which enabled us to operate at 100 millikelvin for the best part of our night. So, what do we actually see? Well, if we take a spectrum of some sort of individual line sources, this is what we were seeing from our first uh, arrays. And we were getting a typical energy resolution of sort of around about eight. So, that's probably actually closer to sort of broadband imaging, maybe a little bit better than broadband imaging. Okay. On this first one. But we were way, you know, far away. From, uh, from the just sort of fundamental limit. Uh, this is pretty much the first sort of image we took with, with Archons. This is a six by six mosaic of uh, a planetary nebula. And as you can see in here, each one of these pixels, for each one of these pixels, we actually have a sort of spectrum from, in this case, about 400 nanometers up to 1.2 microns. There were some science papers that came out of this. Uh, so this is a, um, a photon counting detector. It's photon counting in high time resolution. It's obligatory to observe the crab pulsar. So that's exactly what we did. We observed the crab pulsar and observed these sort of giant pulses from the, uh, the crab pulsar you know, simultaneous with the, the radio observations. But we also sort of slightly more interestingly looked at sort of these short period binaries. And that's what I'm going to come on to a little bit later. I think that's one of the key strengths of this instrument are some of these ultra compact binaries. Which have ties nowadays to sort of multi messenger astronomy. So, 
this is a summary down of, of, of the sort of characteristics of MKIDs. The first ones were in 2011. This is the sort of numbers I just showed you from, from our comms. Already by 2016, there we have a second instrument on, on Sky, or UCSB have a second instrument on Sky called Darkness, and that already increased to sort of 10,000 pixels. So you can see where these are going. The current largest one is about 20,000 pixels. The, uh, and everything is sort of increasing and going in the right direction with better spectral resolution. Uh, the time resolution, typically we time tag photons to around about one microsecond. Is there just a, a picture of the 10,000 pixel array that was used in darkness? And uh, there's a whole host of sort of new materials being tested, including what is more commonly used now as platinum silicide. And this is really to get to uh, over some of the issues that we had in the early days of the uniformity of the pixels and their response. Uh, in terms of sort of quantum efficiency, Typically, uh, in the, the early uh, arrays that we have, the well, all the current arrays that we have, the quantum efficiency is relatively low. It's sort of in this 30 to 50 percent range, which, if you're more used to CCDs, is not great. If you're more used to other detectors, probably isn't too bad. But um, there are efforts going on, and this just sort of summarizes some of the efforts uh, ongoing to increase that quantum efficiency. Basically, on the right hand side here, you have this is the substrate. Typically, all you would do normally is you would have this red, the red layer that you see there, which is the, the kid itself. But what the, the team at Esron have done is uh, put a, a layer of aluminium underneath it and a dielectric coating on top of it. And they use this in order to focus the light effectively into the, uh, to trap the light into the connected lenses detector itself. And they've shown on the top right hand side here how you can increase the energy rates, uh, the, sorry, the quantum efficiency up to the sort of 90% level. So it's one of the typical concerns. Uh, one of the concerns is, is the sort of quantum efficiency of these detectors, but as you can see, the, uh, they've demonstrated now relatively recently that uh, we can actually hope to get these up to sort of a, a high quantum efficiency across a wide path. One of the other key sort of performance indicators, if you like, for uh, these detectors is the energy resolution. So the energy resolution, as I said, in the first detectors was somewhere around about sort of 10 of that order, whereas we could hope to get up to 150. And the energy resolution has remained stubbornly low. It's very difficult to get over this 10. And just recently, Peter the Vissers group at Esron have um, I've uh, been looking at this, and the issue is, is that as the photon is absorbed into the superconductor, it also generates a lot of phonons, as well as breaking uh, pairs, and these phonons are typically lost to the substrate. So we see this on the left-hand side here, that we have this uh, central line and, and the ground domain. As a photon comes in, it is absorbed into the atom, in this case aluminium, but a lot of the phonons are just lost in substrate where they very quickly dissipate across the entire device. And what, so what they did was they actually etched away the material underneath and made this, uh, this membrane material. So each pixel is floating on this very small membrane and that tracked the phonons for longer and enabled a much higher energy resolution. So they show here on the right hand side here, uh, the, the sort of ones to look at is, you know, as I say, the typical ones that we had previously have been sort of 10 to 20 range, and they've now demonstrated that in that same range they can get a sort of energy resolution of around 50. So at 50, we're starting to talk about spectroscopy, maybe just about, but uh, I'll show you later on how we can use this to actually get a much higher spectral resolution as well. But this, this is ongoing research. Let's say this was published uh, a year or so ago. And it's still really waiting to be put into large arrays. So there's sort of two strands. One is the demonstrating at a single pixel level, demonstrating technology. A second one is, is, is expanding that up to the bigger arrays. So UCSB decided to take a slightly different tact to, um, to increase the, the energy resolution. And what they did was instead of having this um, uh, complicated membrane device, they actually put a layer of indium underneath the detector. And this has a very different 
uh, phonon states compared to the superconductor, and it effectively acts as a mirror for the uh, the phonons. So they are really just just sort of uh, any any uh, optical photons that are absorbed into the detector, they bounce around a little bit more and are reflected back by thinium, whereas ones that go into the substrate stay in the substrate if you want because they're not ones that you want. And so they actually they didn't quite get the same gain in energy resolution. They got to about sort of 30 from 20. But this is based on their existing 20,000 pixel array development. So they could very quickly uh, roll this out into this. So energy resolution is moving in the right direction as well. So I try this, I have to apologize whenever I show this because this is my personal sort of uh, take on detectors for astronomy. People will argue, depending on, on the technology that you use yourself, typically, that you think it's better. That's up to you. Okay, but you can sort of see that in some ways this is also showing, going down, I hope, time. Okay, so for many years we used our eyes, which are actually pretty good. Then we moved on to onto photographic plates. Okay, for running photomultipliers before we moved on to the sort of um, semiconductor detectors and more recently into the APGs. And I sort of summarized a little difficult to read up top here actually. So on the left hand side here we have the sensitivity, then we have the noise, then we have the time resolution, energy resolution, okay, array size, and the cost. Okay, so you can see for these different ones. So what I sort of am hoping that I'm trying to convince you is that uh, you know this is where we are sort of at at the moment, and this is where we, we hope to be in the future, and then we can see that the you know M kids is are uh, a lot more green than red. Okay, that's the best way to say. So now we have these sort of arrays of, of M kids. We can have our notional you know 10,000, 20,000 pixel M kid array. What can we do with them? How can we use these detectors to push in certain areas of, of astronomy? Okay. And we came up with a sort of a range of different um, areas. These are the ones that are being worked on at the moment, sort of actively to some degree or another. Okay. And really, each one of these, you know, takes advantage of a different characteristic of the uh, of the energy. Okay. So we have our uh, on the left hand side here. This is sort of uh, you know if you wanted to do classification transients, then we had this was archons as I say, the first instrument we had. We also had a concept of putting a larger array in an instrument called Krakens, um, yeah, um, well, which was a Keck version of, of, of archons. And then you know you'll see that you know we, we then have kid spec, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about in a moment. This is using them in a slightly novel way to increase the spectral resolution. But we also, they're, all, they're not just for sort of time resolved observations, if you like. They're also useful for, for other things. So we have here a, a, a hugely multiplex. This was a, a GigaZ is a, a, a concept for an instrument to measure 2 billion redshifts from the entire LSST uh, catalog. Okay, which would then take low resolution spectroscopy using MKIS on a four meter telescope and deliver additional constraints for the uh, uh, for the uh, cosmological parameters. Should have actually, sorry, put a reference to each one of these at the bottom for the missile aspect. Finally, exoplanets, which is where they're being used most actively at the moment. The MEC instrument uh, built by UCSB is uh, attached to the Subaru telescope, it's a permanent instrument there. Taking um, the light from the SketsAO extreme adaptive optics system. And finally, on the right side, slightly different, it's not actually a sort of science camera anymore. In Durham, we're also working on uh, using the detectors for wavefront sensing, again, for extreme adaptive optics system for, for PCS on the ELT as an ultra fast wavefront sensor. So, as I say, I'm just going to concentrate on a couple of these uh, in, the, in the remaining time of the talk. Okay, so the first one is classification transition. Unfortunately, notice both of these as told you gave me in my sort of like bio that you know have slight you know uh, favoritism for uh, transients and, uh, and such like. So. Okay, so we had the you know classification of, of transients is just some sort of some, some numbers that are up there. 
you know, at the time PTF was discovering, you know, around about a sort of million objects per night, million objects, I should say, sorry, per night. Okay, of which about a thousand are real sources, 300 of these are variable sources, and 10 supernovae every night. And it really changed the game. Okay, for the Dark Energy Survey, you know, uh, they have a, a order of a thousand Type 1A uh, supernova detected in the first year, but they were only able to follow up 70 of those. And, you know, by the time you come on to LSST, it's got about 100 times the volume of PTF, so you multiply all this by 100. And you can see that, you know, really the classification of transits, the spectroscopic classification of transits is going to be really challenging. Marshalling smaller telescopes um, to, uh, sorry, the, so taking the, the, the input from your smaller telescopes and using that to marshal the large telescopes is a, is a big problem in this problem. So, Obviously, what we, we thought was that, uh, you know, that, that with, with M kids, you can do um, uh, a lot better. You get a low resolution spectrum for each object in the field. It's very good for classifying of, uh, of targets. Okay, so this is the idea of this sort of was the Archons or, or 10K or Kraken's instrument, was to put it on a relatively small two meter telescope. Okay, we give you. Uh, uh, Similar signal to noise as, as some of the other experiments, but also would enable you to push into the sort of Y and J bands. So uh, the other thing with the this uh, semiconductor detectors is obviously the silicon band gap around about one EV means that you can't go beyond about a thousand nanometers. Uh, okay, so there's no such issue with with M kids. In fact, the same M kid, if you you know, is sensitive. Uh, to like all the way from sort of 400 nanometers all the way up to two microns. So you can use that entire band. There may be reasons you don't want to, by the time you get into the infrared, you have additional issues like this, the sky brightness and things like this, uh, which you know have more photons, but you know it, it certainly doesn't stop at the sort of one micron. And that little bit of additional bandwidth can really enable you to discern different types of objects. And on top of that, you also obviously get the variability information for free compared to your semiconductor detector observation where you have to uh, observe for your predefined integration. So we, we put in a few sort of supernovae uh, sources. These are simulated observations on, on Keck. And uh, what you can see is on the, uh, the left-hand side here, you see uh, one with an R of sort of 20. Okay, so the, uh, the the black points here are sort of your, if you like, your individual spectrally resolved elements. Okay, uh, and then on the right hand side, here's what you do if you can get towards an R or R. But as you can clearly see, you know, you can you can very quickly determine the difference between these different types of, uh, of objects with a single observation. Okay, so I did my PhD on. So echo mapping is an indirect imaging technique, okay, which can help you. Again, okay, I'm not going to go into the details on this, uh, but just to say it's sort of analogous to reverberation mapping in HDM, where you basically use the time delay between a directly observed X-ray X-ray light and the optical or near infrared light, and you can use that the time difference, which is the, the order of sort of seconds in the, in extra binary. You can use that time delay in order to determine where in the binary the reprocessing took place. Okay, but in order to do this, you know you need sort of high time resolution, wide pass back, all of very sensitive observations, all of the things that we can get with our energy arrays. And one of the key things that enables you to do is put um, constraints on the inclination of the system. And the way we've done this so far, on this slide, no, uh, done this so far is by looking at X-ray bursts. If you look at X-ray bursts, then we see a reprocessed optical burst. If the burst takes place at different binary phases, then we get a snapshot of the system in that phase. And with just three observations of uh, these reprocessed bursts for a given system, we can measure the inclination of that system, which is something that's uh, been difficult to do. And then it also obviously enables you to determine more accurately the mass of the compact object. Slightly more recently, we've been looking at sort of IR far infrared fast timing on X-ray binaries. Okay, again, this has been looking in the in the uh, what I should have said was that the, <laughs> the 
The reason I didn't do any much more the echo mapping was because actually it turned out that not all of the light is pre-processed in the way we thought it was. A lot of the light actually in the infrared is actually directly observed potentially from the jet cloud flow system. So we started looking for these reprocessed signals and we kept finding that they weren't reprocessed. We kept finding that the, you know, in fact, you know, directly observed uh, variability. And this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So this is the cross correlation function for the uh, sort of on the left hand side here. And we can see that there is a slight lag. So this is slightly offset from zero. Okay, so there is some sort of uh, time delay between the two systems. And also we see, you know, things like infrared QPOs and things like this. So this is very exciting. The timescales on here are sort of, you know, seven hertz. So in order to observe that, we need to be observing relatively faint objects, 15 magnitude objects at seven hertz. If you need a big telescope, you also need a very sensitive detector. Okay. So that was one concept. That's the sort of the, the taking the arc, taking the MKID array and just basically pointing it at the sky and taking multi-band low noise imaging. Okay, and you can do that for as it's shown, sort of uh, transient um, uh, supernovae to, to measure the SED of the objects, or you can use the timing um, in order to the variability of objects. But what you can't really do still is, is look with, with sufficient spectral resolution to resolve the lines of these systems and get dynamical information, for instance, from these uh, systems. So KidSpec overcomes that limitation, okay? For a, for a single object, it, 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 is, it uses the MKIT in a way that I'll come on to in a moment that enables you to get sort of an, a spectral resolution of around about a few thousand rather than a few, okay? And, you know, we can then distinguish sort of velocity components in the emission lines and refracting binaries or other systems, okay? With a wide pass band and good temporal resolution. Now, for those of you, you know, who do uh, optical and, and infrared spectroscopy, you'll probably recognize that a lot of these look like sort of uh, use cases for X-Shooter and the VLT. Now, X-Shooter is a phenomenally successful um, uh, spectrograph that's been on the VLT, multi-arm spectrograph, spectral resolution of several thousand, okay. But, and, and as I say, it's been phenomenally successful, but it does have its problems as well. Okay, and one of these is, is things like the, the background subtraction and, uh, and, uh, and also the fact that it needs three arms, which has its own limitations. And, uh, so we came up with a concept of kid spec, which is uh, a way to do a similar sort of uh, X shooter type instrument, but with uh, M kids. Okay, and just for just to sort of get you started, one of the sort of the, the, the initial gains in it is this is the optical layout of the infrared arm of X shooter. You don't expect you to be able to see a huge amount of this. But the light comes in, it bounces around, it gets collimated over here, comes to, through some prisms to a grating here, it comes back in reflection, bounces around a bit more, comes through a camera and gets to a detector. That's 21 optical surfaces before it gets to the detector. So you can imagine that the losses from that are enormous. And with one of the main reasons for this is because of this need to cross disperse and use the spectrograph. This is the output from sort of data format from XUTO. It's in a shell spectrograph. I'm not sure if people are familiar with the shell spectrograph, but the, the light is dispersed uh, in sort of in this direction by the grating. Okay, but then because of the uh, grating equation, these are then the orders of the light. So this is this your n times uh, lambda. Okay. And so what you need to do with those prisms is disperse the light in a cross direction, cross dispersed spectrum. So what you can see from here is that, you know, this is increasingly, this is a sort of blue end for a given order, but then these are increasingly red orders. So wavelength sort of zigzags up the detector. But what you can see is the light is dispersed onto many, many pixels. And each one of those pixels has a read noise. So it means that for a, a medium spectral resolution, you get a, a high uh, noise. Uh, input. So if we take, if we just think now about sort of one of these pixels in the middle, for instance, <laughs> and look at this cross dispersed direction, if we measure that spectrum, then what we would see would be something like this. Okay, so each one of these peaks is one of those orders, and you can see that this generates a spectrum. 
that is okay. So what we can do is instead of having a prism to disperse that light onto a semiconductor detector, if we put an M kit down onto it, we can use the intrinsic energy resolution of the M kit in order to discern the different um, uh, orders. Okay. And this makes it much, much easier. It means we only need to disperse in one direction. And so if we then build up a linear array of these M kits, so as I said, that one pixel, if you then, if you think about this, as you can sort of see that same fan diagram in this direction, but in terms of M kits, all we're doing is putting one single line of M kit pixels there rather than a big two-dimensional semiconductor detector. And we can show this is a sort of, this is, these are designed to have a very similar characteristics to X shooter, okay, that with, sort of a little optimistic in the, in the coming day, in the coming years, we could hope to have this using about sort of 8,000 energy pixels. As I say, it's a little optimistic because what we, what, we, what we need to do is because of the energy resolution, we need to be able to discern these orders. And you can see that here we have the sort of light from two different orders, sort of around about 400 nanometers. And depending on um, uh, the final energy resolution that we need actually depends on, on how well we, we want to be able to discern those orders. And that's something that we have to be investigating. Um, but it could be that we could do this with rather than an R of 50, we might even get this with an R of 20. So, as I say, we have this long 1D array. So, rather than having a, a two dimensional array as we do in the semiconductor, we can have a one dimensional array get the same information. But actually, we may actually want to have more uh, linear arrays. And then each one of these linear arrays is a different spatial pixel. So, if you think about a, a long slit spectrograph, for instance, then your long slit would be in this direction. Or you could reformat that into uh, an integral field unit. And with a megapixel array, which is the sort of uh, uh, holy grail, if you like, of, of, of n kit development, then you could, you know, in, the, in some of the previous ones, get, for instance, around 250 statues, which is a very good size uh, integral field unit where each one of those factors gives you uh, a spectral resolution of several thousand, photon counting, zero noise. Perfect cosmic race attraction because we have the timing information and all of these uh, additional, and also all the way from 400 to either H or K band. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, how does this compare to X shooter? We did a simple sort of signal to noise uh, comparison. Basically, as you can see, there are uh, contours on here. So where it's greater than one, it means that um, kid spec wins over X shooter. It's always greater than one everywhere in this diagram, but you can see that it really starts to gain here, which is unsurprisingly when you get to faint objects, because you know and, and the faint objects that read noise from the detectors in X shooter starts to dominate, and also at low integration times. So anything that is fast and faint, we're going to do a lot better with with. Uh, and this is just a sort of an hour sort of final scientific demonstration of that, if you like. So these are again, it's a little bit difficult to read. Um, increasing, so this is a short period binary. Those of you who are familiar with the binary, you see this characteristic S wave with the Doppler shift of an emission line uh, due to the orbital motion of the binary. On the left hand side here, we have a, an eight meter telescope. With, uh, with read noise. So this is your semiconductor detector on an eight meter telescope. So you clearly see, you can't see anything. This is now uh, an eight meter telescope without read noise. I have to say, you know, this is, um, uh, well, this, is this, this, I can't remember the magnitude of this object now, unfortunately. But it's very, you know, it's a 300 second orbital period. This is a very faint, fast um, uh, object. Okay, and then this is what you could do on an ELT with read noise. Okay, and finally an ELT without any read noise. So this is basically an M kit on the ELT, and this is X shooter on the ELT. 
And you can clearly see that for these very faint objects, you really need the, the power of, of, uh, of something like KidSpec uh, in order if you want to do this very fast observations. Why might we want to do these observations? So this is a very similar sort of thing now. Again, this is you know an eight meter with no read noise. Uh, well, that age is some of this analysis, a 42 meter or an ELT with uh, with read noise or an ELT without read noise. Okay, and this is for one of the least of verification sources. It's, this is one of the characteristic sort of magnitude 25 objects that they're going to look at in order to, to, to characterize the, the, the space in the performance of the in the future. With the sort of typical double white dwarf binary with an orbital period of 10 minutes. Okay. And you can see here that re realistically, you won't be able to do any of this on an 8 meter telescope, even on a, on a 42, on a 38 meter telescope with, uh, with read noise, it, it becomes challenging and you really sort of need the, the additional timing of uh, that uh, and no read noise. And then, so just finally, so this is then the S, -way. this is then the sort of radial velocity curve. You can use to determine the binary parameters just as we used to do back in the day or with uh, pause. Okay, so that was a, a final sort of demonstration of it. And I'll now leave you just with a sort of summary slide. So I hope that I may have convinced some of you or began to convince some of you that uh, NKIDs are, are really a very powerful detector technology, they're a very scalable detector technology. Uh, and they are growing in maturity, although really what we need to do is put them on sky and use them a lot. Uh, and I think that's how they'll mature the best. Uh, we have, as I say, we have demonstrated on the on sky more than a decade ago now. We're still working on a lot of the features of the arrays and things like this, but they are scalable and they really could. And this isn't my quote, actually, I should say this is a quote from this, the Keck director uh, a few years ago now. That they uh, that they, they could transform astronomy in the same way as transition from photographic plates to semiconductor detectors. Okay, and it's really it's actually it's, it's optical and near eye harm astronomy are one of the few uh, areas of astrophysics that don't use superconducting detectors. So they're actually for those of you who are also optical astronomers, we have until recently been the anomaly, right? You know, in the sub millimeter of the X rays and things like this, superconducting detectors are already the detector choice. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you also that you know they, they are also not just for astronomy. So as I said, right back to the beginning in CFAI, we, we have people working in a broad uh, variety of fields, and one of my PhD students or two of them actually are now working on applications for microscopy. There's also a lot of spin out into other lenses as well. Thank you very much. One thing that source is the 20th magnitude, I think. 20th, isn't it? I think. Uh, it's here. Yeah, because so I find that the distance for the most absence of the distance. So those who told us about the most flexing, what kind of numbers are it usable? So, yeah, it, it's, it's scalable in a number of different ways. So on a single feed line, we operate in the four to eight gigahertz range, and that is matched to the, the availability of the low noise amplifier, the cryogenic amplifiers that we need. Okay, so the, the past that, that, that frequency code that I showed is in four to eight gigahertz, and typically we separate each tone by two megahertz. So we can get 2000 resonators, 2000 pixels onto a single feed line. And then you can multiplex feed lines as well. So for each readout system, you would have 2,000 resonators. And then, like with the, the, uh, the MEC instruments on, on Sketch.io, it's 10 feed lines. So that's how they do 20,000, because they have 10 of these microwave feed lines, each one operating independently. So it, 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 it's a mosaic, kind of, but it's a mosaic on the same substrate, and on the same detector. So it's, I guess it, it's not really mosaic. I guess it's more analogous on, on a sort of semiconductor detector and kind of different readout ports. Right? I mean, you have multiple port readouts on the semiconductor detector. Like a CCD with different amplifiers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Is it the fiber effects coming from the public domain? 
It doesn't have to be. So I've actually just now and now in the lab in, in Durham, I now have one that is fiber fed and one that is well, almost uh, optically fed. So the first Arcon's instrument was just direct lens couple design, very simple, uh, re-image app. Uh, it's, it's actually very cool to be able to, in the lab, you can look down, if you, you, know, you get close to the focal plane, you can look down into the cryostat and you see this array that is sat there with a hundred million kelvin. It's a very sort of strange thing to be able to see something inside of it that's at a hundred million kelvin. Uh, can't shine a light there, though, mind, because uh, obviously we, you would start to warm up the array and change the properties, but for the very low light levels so of the operator changing it as well. Because if you notice that they uh, couldn't catch the number, but you are uh, expecting that the array size will be improved and increased at the point approaching the time, hopefully. Uh, but for how following up LSST, it would be really challenging, right? And how many objects, how can you do that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I did have some spare slides, but I took them out of the, uh, took them out of the presentation. <laughs> um, so there's a concept paper, it's, it's Gigazi concept paper, it's, it's by Danica Marsley. Um, basically, what it does is it uses 100,000 M kits in an array. Each M kit uh, has a very large plate scale. So it actually sees six by six arc seconds in the sky. Okay. And then what we do is we place a, a mask, DMD, whatever it is, to select a small. So we, we did, we ran the numbers that from LSST, typically every uh, and which was 10 by 10, 10 by 10, 6 by 6, we have two concepts, mega Z, Z. Uh, but 10 by 10, our second field of view, uh, from LSST, you should typically expect to have about 0.5 objects of interest in that field of view. So you would either put a little hole or a little DMD mirror or something onto the object, or you would leave it as a sky measure. Okay. So then in a, a 15 minute integration, of that, you can get down to the, to the depth that you require to, to do a photometric redshift measurement, okay, or photometric redshift measurement, okay? And that's how you build up over, I think it was two years of a four meter telescope, then uh, you would be able to measure two billion redshifts. Uh, non which point of this for this Well, no, I mean, it's not, it is, yeah, it, it was, uh, 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 the, uh, which is the, the one that oh, dark yeah. energy the, oh, the yeah. yeah yeah it was it was an idea for a spectroscopic model mm -hmm. to, to uh, yeah, basically um, um, but yeah I mean it's not you know it's very interesting if you use masks to do it then actually you, you calculate it as a thin in bar mask one millimeter in bar mask or something the number of masks you would need to be in the building during the time or something so it, it's it's not necessarily the best way to do it but uh, and the way that you win is actually not so much from the sensitivity and having more bands than just UGRZ, but it's actually the fact that you, you can push into the infrared at the same time and you don't have these catastrophic failures of using lower and higher energy objects. So you practice the mission. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Thank you for your nice book. We just can hold up to one days. So <laughs> I wanted to ask something about uh, the material you used. You said you used uh, titanium nitride, am I right? Yes. Okay. So why you chose that material? What is the selection that yeah. you choose the proper material? And you said you cool the system uh, down to 100 millikelvin, which is quite old. Uh, probably using helium four and helium three mixtures. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes no. So um, the material, the Thai nitride, was chosen because you can change the uh, the nitride, you change the stoichiometry of the material, and you can tune the the critical temperature. What is the critical temperature for so, the so it can be tuned to about nine hundred millikelvin. No, it's typically yes, it's two, but you can tune it by reducing the nitrogen rate to be around about 900 millikelvin. So what we want to do is to be around about eight times lower than the critical temperature to avoid having thermally generated quasar, uh, quasar particles, breaking as thermal. Okay. 
So in order to do that, then we can operate. So the second part of question was yes, we use this is we do this in a, a helium dilution refrigerator. Our comms and the other instruments in Austin actually use adiabatic demagnetization refrigerators, which don't use helium three, but they have a strong magnet. So there's, there's pros and cons to both of them. But yes, we need to so we need to operate at around about eight times lower than critical temperature. So for titanium nitride, which was used uh, early on, we had to tune it to be around about eight or nine, oh, 900, and so then operate a bit colder. With platinum silicide and uh, has, a, um, has a, a TC of around about one Kelvin, so we can operate at around about 120 millikelvin. Other materials that are being used are things like hafnium, Hafnium has a much lower, has a TC of around about uh, four or 500, I think, millikelvin. So for that, we need to cool down to around 50 millikelvin and operate at 50 millikelvin, which makes it much more challenging. But I'm not going to have to go back. Maybe not. You can go back to go back. I think maybe I'm too far. Maybe that's the problem. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is the the gap energy, and the gap. Was it gap energy or binding energy? Yeah. Well, two times the binding energy. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So uh, actually, this other one's better. So yeah. So um, no, that's not. Okay. But you can see that basically the. The resolution you can hope to achieve depends on this gap energy because it basically if if the gap energy is lower then for the same energy photon you break more quick repairs so you get more signal so by going to lower tc materials like hafnium the hope is that instead of this being 150 then actually this could be 200 or 300. okay so you would gain more but you have to operate at lower temperatures now operating at lower temperatures I only started working on low temperature detectors 10, 12 years ago now, something like this. Before that, I thought that liquid nitrogen was cold, and that was you know bad enough that working in an observatory using liquid nitrogen, that's good. But actually, using these dilution refrigerators nowadays, but especially the quantum computing is going on, we use exactly the same fridges as they do. It's really as a turnkey system now. Um, the, the fridge in my lab, you can go in, you switch it on. It's, it's all that. It's closer, it's yeah. It's pulse tube down to, to four Kelvin, and then the dilution uh, refrigerator kicks in. And basically, you go in, you switch it on, you come back about 18 hours later, and it's at operating temperature, and then it can run for months. And uh, what is the whole size of the detector? Area size, one centimeter? So, a typical pixel is around about 150 microns. So then one, one, pixel. one pixel is 150 microns. Okay, like so, so then, yeah, the typically the the 2,000 pixel arrays then are you know 10 millimeters or something. So, so, so okay, so the conventional photolithography methods uh, are enough to fabricate yeah. this. Yes. Yeah, and they're actually relatively. That's another advantage over the transition edge sensors is that lithographically they're really quite simple structures. Yeah. There's no cold wiring or anything like this. So mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a, a few layers. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I don't do device fabrication myself. That's what I said. I often say, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the applications of them. And I come from the astronomy background rather than the detectors background. Well, uh, do you know information about how to blow hydrogen nitrides? What is the growth method for that material? Is it sputter? Uh, initially, yes. Yeah, so, our uh, titanium nitride film was, was from sputtering initially, um, and it was done by JPL basically. So JPL and UOCSB worked together strongly on that. But because of this issue with the uniformity of the film, due to the so trying to change the nitrogen flow rate and have that be uniform, they actually did look at sort of ALD uh, mm. and having some sort of stoichiometric titanium nitride and just titanium. And, and building up layers to sort of change the properties of that way. 
So there's been a few different ways to do it, but ultimately people seem to be moving a bit away from, from those and going to other materials and then using the anti reflection proteins in the quantum efficiency. Because the metallic water is so important, you need yeah. to keep the upper uh, temperature to the together yeah. without stepping. Absolutely, yeah, and exactly. And that, like I say, with the with the, the anti reflection coatings and things like this, that's been one of the challenges is not destroying the film or doing the processing for the anti reflection. Yeah. Any other questions or anything? My actual very last reminder, reminder one time uh, in the very beginning of the European post, I will be asking you to show me what I call the digital store. Yeah. Uh, at that time, I remember it, it was quite expensive for us because it's a research lab to work with this instrument, it's not fabricated. Yeah. So, yeah. is there any development regarding that direction? I mean, um, and cost or cost estimate for such instruments, for instance, or for the yeah, I mean, a rough order of magnitude for a 20,000 pixel instrument is, is you know, somewhere between sort of 700 and a million euros. 700,000 to a million euros. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. For the whole thing. For, it's actually the readout that is probably one of the more expensive things. Still. Yeah, I remember the refrigerator as well. The refrigerator, yeah. I mean, a dilution refrigerator now is, is somewhere around sort of 250, 300,000 euros. So that's yeah, about fifty percent. The other thirty or forty percent goes on the readout, and then all the other bits of the, the other things in the place. So, but there's more. <laughs> but yeah, but, it, but I agree that you know, the, and the next level is to get industrial, hopefully industrial, or at least sort of more dedicated groups doing the, the fabrication. Yeah. So uh, I think that's where up until now. So you know, when we the discussion with with Ben. About it, you know, he he has to be pulling in so many different directions, you know, because he's been the only one working on the arrays up until about five years ago. So what he really focused on was trying to get bigger arrays because he felt that that's what astronomers wanted, and you needed a bigger field of view at the expense maybe of the uniformity because you can sort of worry about that later and the quantum efficiency because you can worry about that. So, and but now there's other groups involved, and I think Esron in 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 the Netherlands uh, are really sort of pushing and looking at doing they're they're more of a detector group which you know also have an eye to applications as well rather than a bit more so I think they'll really help with with making much more uniform rates and much more capable rates as well. Thank you very much again. Yeah, that's probably with me. I think that's make a bit far away.